Okay, so it's about time and we have critical mass. So let me begin today's uh, presentation. This is a three week uh, or three session uh, webinar, advanced webinar on introduction to Python tools for visualization and analysis of uh, NASA model, air quality model outputs. And this is part two. Uh, where we are going to introduce some of the Python tools. So here is our training agenda. In week one, we have reviewed NASA air quality forecast and reanalysis. In addition to that, we have also done exercise to download and analyze data using NASA Giovanni tool, uh, as well as some other justice tools, including Jupyter Notebook. And in today, part two, we will uh, look a little bit more on the Python tools and play with some more data. In week three, we will use some of the tools and knowledge which we learned in part one and part two and perform uh, air quality assessment uh, for two different case studies. Here is our team. Uh, myself, uh, Pawan Gupta, I'm senior scientist here. The picture is on the right most. Uh, here at USRA at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. My colleague, Dr. Sarah Strode, she will be doing week three presentation and exercise. She is a scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Melanie Fallett Cook, she has already given presentation during part one. She is also a uh, scientist, air quality scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, DC. So here are some of the, our uh, outline or what we call learning objective for today's session. Uh, and today we expect after the end of this presentation that uh, we will be able to teach you how to download, read, subset, and do mapping of various output coming from NASA's GIOS model using some of the Python script. We will also look how we can extract data on a given ground location uh, using some Python script. We will also look how to save some of the model outputs in more user-friendly format, uh, CSV file. And then we will learn to do a special and temporal collocation methods, an example of comparing uh, model output with the satellite data and then performing some validation analysis uh, with the surface observation. So these are the number of topics which we will be covering in today's session. So before we start today's uh, presentation in Python, I would like to make sure that everybody is able to uh, walk along with me or perform the exercise along with me. In order to do that, uh, we will need a Google account, which we will mention as a prereq. So if you do not have a Google account, this is a good time to create one. Uh, Earth Data Login uh, has, uh, if you want to download any of the data, you will need the Earth Data Login. Uh, if you don't, uh, we specifically will not download any data in today's session. Uh, so principally it's not required, but uh, it is good to have it. And then the download data and codes for today's session. So you will see a link in the uh, chat. If you have not already done this, please do it now. Uh, the next step in that will be to uploading to the Google Drive. So what I'm going to do next is uh, let's go, let, let's check quickly how many people actually have done this task. I'm going to just put out a poll question um, and if you can answer that, that will help me to understand where we are. So you should see a poll uh, on your screen. You can choose uh, one or more options. Uh, and this will be open for about 30 seconds. So today's session, uh, we will have more interactive. You will see poll question, quiz question in between the presentation and we will move back and forth between the presentations and the Jupyter Notebook Python script. Another reminder while you're responding to this poll, if you have questions, uh, please use the questions uh, 
button or options in go to webinar control panel to put your question we will address all your question at the end of uh, presentation or uh, exercise okay so we got few more second and then i'm going to close about we have about 45 percent people voted so if you really wants to go along with me and do your run the python script i would strongly recommend you do all those three tasks uh, let me see the result okay so all those who responded uh, still about 50 percent of people have not downloaded the data so let's go through that exercise um, how to download the data and get to your google drive to uh, make it ready for the presentation so to do that uh, the next few slides basically shows how to do that uh, for your future reference but what i'm going to do is uh, we will walk you through that exercise so i will minimize my presentation and again i strongly recommend that you uh, close all your uh, other windows or things which you are not using so that your computer is on full power and in your internet uh, works perfectly fine throughout the exercise. So again, uh, in the chat, you will find a link to the training web page. If it is not there, you can Google search. This is the same link where you have gone for the registration or for the to get the material. In that link, if you go to that link, you will see part two, introduction to Python tools for visualization and analysis. Here, if you click on the part two data that will take you to the google drive which is should be available to everyone publicly if i click on the part two then there is a folder called part two codes and data and i can click here go on top right here there is a small arrow and if i click there and there is a download second last button if I click that, it will zip all the files within the code. If this can take a little bit time, depending on your internet speed, uh, but there's not too much data. Uh, so let it take for a minute or so uh, while I will show you how to uh, upload this data uh, to our drive. So uh, it's almost done for me. Um, if it is not fast enough, let it happen and then you can follow along uh, later on. So let me, since I already have downloaded the data, it's already on my drive. Let me show you how to put it here on now. To, to, uh, to add this data to your Google Drive, what we will do is we will need Google Code Lab Notebook. And as we saw this features, in presentation one uh, if you do not have you can uh, click this plus sign on right side get add on and that will take you to this here you can search collab and then it will come up here if it says installed it means it is already installed and ready for you to use if it is not you can click here and it will take uh, very few uh, seconds to install and it should be ready once you do that what you will do is you click on my drive this will show you all the folders which are there if you edit that google code notebook uh, already then you will see a folder called collab notebooks you click on that folder and let me change my account for some reason it has changed so make sure i'm in the right account so google collab notebook and then once you that then you see there are multiple folders these are my pre-existing folders if you are doing this first time you will not see any file of them you can unzip the file which you have downloaded or folder which you have downloaded from the google drive and then there will be you see a drive and then you will see there are five files in that folder you can select all of them and then you can drag here and bring them all on your google drive so depending on your internet speed the data files are a little bit larger in size the total size of the file is about 500 mb 
uh, they can take a couple of minutes uh, depending on the internet speed. so once they are downloaded we are almost ready to go through the exercise so what i'm going to do next is while i'm going through the rest of the presentation i would strongly uh, recommend everyone to actually uh, go through this exercise and make sure your uh, google drive is ready for the uh, to do the exercise so let me quickly show one more step uh, before we go to the uh, presentation back since i have already done this exercise previously so i have a folder called aqf fab 22 session 2 and it has all the code and uh, uh, there are three netcdf files and there is a uh, csv file and there is a python file again if you have already added the colleague notebook then your python file will be easily uh, detected uh, by the google drive and it will show this uh, infinity symbol okay so if it is taking more time for you uh, you can uh, you can let it happens but i want to go ahead and show the python code uh, steps before we go back to the presentation to, to show that what i will do is i will double click my code name read and map geos final ipynb this is a python script file or what we call jupyter notebook file if i double click this then it will automatically open the file in called collab.research.google okay and you will see this on your computer screen there is a, some description here uh, I would like to thank Dr. Alkma Saeed, who actually helped in developing this code for this training. Uh, Dr. Alkma is also a scientist here at USRA uh, at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. I would like to again notify everyone that these codes which we are showing today are sample code. It means uh, we are providing them you to build basic functionality to access geos data sets geos model output in different format uh, it is if you are using them for research or application it is highly recommend that you check the accuracies of each of these code and modify them according to your own need since uh, the code involves downloading the data uh, downloading some of the python package uh, in order to run this, uh, it can take some time. So what I'm going to do is, first thing I will do is, I'll go to runtime and make sure that everything is reset so that we can see how each function is running. So I'll go and say factory reset runtime. Once I do that, all my code, all my setting is resetted to the factory setting means no code has been run. There's nothing in the memory of Colab or Jupyter Notebook. This will allow me to run everything fresh. Now the next step, what it does is the step one is we want to read the data from the Google Drive, which where we downloaded. These are the data where we downloaded and these are the Google uh, drive. So we want to mount that drive. And to do mount, there's a first function here, just two line. And you, if you click on this arrow, it will start mounting the drive now when it does the mounting you will see it will ask for permission to access the google drive and you will see this a note here which says permit this notebook to access your google drive if i say connect to google drive it will open up and ask me to select the account for which i want to connect if you are already logged in your chrome uh, a browser then it will do things automatically for you you just have to select uh, and then it says allow once i do it will mount the drive so that i can access the data files from the drive in this code and read them so once i done that it says mounted it contained drive the step two is 
installing the useful Python package, which will be required to read and map and do other stuff throughout the Python script. And since this can take some time, that is why I'm showing this step. And again, you click on the step two, it will start downloading. Again, it can take few seconds, few minutes, depending on your internet speed. So once this is done, once you click on the step two, I also want you to click on the step three. Well, let's click on the step two now and let it download, let it run it. Do not close this window and we will go back to the presentation and then we'll come back. Hopefully this should be downloaded and will be ready for us to do it. So let me give you just uh, one minute before I start on the presentation uh, so that you have time to go through this step. Again, these are the same instruction which I just showed you uh, through the walking. Uh, if you need reference or you need to do this in futures, uh, all the screenshots are here step by steps, how to do those steps. After all the things which we have gone through, your drive should look like this. And let me just see how many people were able to get to this point in this time. Uh, so I'm going to just put another quick poll question. And if you can respond to that quickly, I will know uh, if you are ready uh, for the next step. So please respond to the poll question. Uh, we will keep it open for another 30 seconds. Again, this is time for you to perform those steps. If for whatever reason internet is slow or whatever reason you're not able to do those, this is the time to catch up. Okay, great. So more and more people uh, we have 23% voting as of now. Um, it's just a yes, no question. Um, I know a lot of people are still working on it. So that is good. Uh, hopefully by the time I present the next set of slides, uh, your drive in the Google Colab notebook will be ready for doing some data analysis. Okay, uh, so let's move on. We have about 50% people already done. That's great. So let's move on to the uh, next slide. Okay, so what we are going to do next is uh, learn about the some details about when we compare the satellite data with the model uh, model outputs, and then we'll do the same thing for the ground measurement. Okay, so I, I understand that this training does not include any introductions or covering any of the topic related to the satellite data uh, because we consider this is an advanced training. So if you like to go through uh, any of the satellite data or learn about satellite data, I would strongly recommend these two trainings, one on the nitrogen dioxide and one on the NO2. The training page and their YouTube videos are here for your reference similarly we have a extensive training session on using python scripts to read and analyze vs data again all the codes and the training materials are available for you to refer okay so quick reminder uh, we have been uh, looking this special resolution in presentation one and the pre-rack about their quality forecasting basics training uh, I just want to remind everyone that the three data sets which comes out from the GEOS model called GEOS FE, uh, which provides forecasting, GEOS SAFE, which provide chemical forecasting, and then MARA2, which is a reanalysis. Uh, they have a little bit different spatial resolution. Each of them have their own spatial resolution. Both FP and CF are typically around 25 kilometer special grid a uh, bit little bit different uh, along the longitude line and then the mara 2 is about half of that resolution which is half degree by 4, 0.6 to 550 kilometer so just keep in mind when you are using the output the resolutions are uh, take, uh, known okay so let's move on the first step is uh, how we can qualitatively compare 
the model output uh, from the satellite imageries. Uh, when we say satellite imagery, satellite data comes into various format. The, 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 the level one data, what we call is true color imageries or RGBs are shown here on the left. And you can access that using a NASA tool called worldview or the data.nasa.gov. The link is provided. If you have taken any of our previous training, you must have heard about it. Again, it's a very excellent tool to access real time imageries. And what you see here is an example from June 25, 2020. Uh, this is image taken by a viewer sensors. Uh, and what you see here over Africa is a dust outflow from Saharan deserts over Atlantic Ocean and this haziness which you show over Atlantic Ocean and over uh, close to the coast of uh, US and Central America is a dust which is transporting. And when you look the same uh, date uh, from MERA 2, this is aerosol optical thickness which is a column quantity again uh, if you go through any of those satellite training, you will learn more about that quantity. But this is represent total amount of aerosols in the entire column of the atmosphere. And you can see that MERA2, uh, the reanalysis product, uh, nicely capturing this dust plume uh, outflow from Saharan desert or Atlantic and it's a transport. Now, if you can see in the true color image, there are a lot of clouds. Um, but the model does not have that limitation. So when you compare the satellite data during the cloudy condition, you will see the satellite data has limitation of retrieving quantities uh, under cloud-free condition only, whereas the model provides those values um, all the time. So this kind of comparisons uh, shows a broad um, uh, capabilities of model to capture the large scale phenomena such as this one. So a qualitative way to compare the data. Now, this is a special pattern comparison, uh, similar thing, uh, but we are using here Giovanni. Giovanni has been introduced in the last session. Uh, we did not go through the comparison part in the Giovanni, but I would like to just highlight that Giovanni, in Giovanni, you can compare Mera2 uh, product uh, you, with any of the satellite or, uh, product. So this is the same product called aerosol optical depth. On the left is Modis Aqua uh, for July 2020. Uh, so for the entire month. And remember, uh, Modis is a satellite sensor. So it only provides this data during cloud-free conditions. So all the data for the entire months are averaged to create this map on the left. Similarly, MERA2, which is available almost every hour uh, for the entire period, is averaged for the same period and create a nice uh, smooth features, uh, which shows the high value of aerosol optical depth, indicating high loading of dust in the atmosphere. In big pictures, both satellite and MERA are able to capture the large scale features. So again, uh, qualitatively and uh, in fact, if we are using level three data, which is a one degree graded data uh, in Giovanni, you can do some more quantitative analysis as well uh, in using Giovanni. But before we do the quantitative analysis, uh, let's little bit know your data. And when I say know your data means the model is different, satellite is different. There are fundamental differences in the way uh, they have the data. So. The number one is uh, satellites are instantaneous, means typically they overpass certain location, make measurements, and then move on, right? So they don't stay in one place. Uh, so typically when you are using, if LEO, that is a low earth observing satellite, uh, for example, MODIS or VIRS or OMI, they will provide one measurement per day on a given location. If you're using a geostationary satellite, then they can provide more frequent measurement every five minutes, every 10 minutes, or every few minutes, depending on what, uh, uh, what sensor you are using and what parameter you're looking for. On the other hand, models can be instantaneous or averaged over time. So just make sure you understand the timing uh, or the averaging window. As I mentioned earlier, satellite data are only available for cloud-free condition for most pollutant. Uh, model does not depend on that uh, i uh, model provides outputs irrespective of the cloud cover satellite data 
can be averaged uh, on a hourly, daily, monthly, or annual scales. Uh, and then forecasts are typically provided hourly or three hourly depending on the uh, model output, but the reanalysis can be averaged over different time window. Satellite data typically have, if you are using level two data, the high resolution data, then they typically have a varying special exercise, means the spatial resolution changes from the nadir positions to the edge of the swath. We will see that in a minute. If you're using level three data, then they are graded, means they are averaged over certain time and over certain uh, spatial area. Whereas the GIOS outputs are on a fixed angular grids, uh, uh, which are provided as output. So th these are some of the things uh, to note down. Now, in terms of uh, more quantitative analysis, we must uh, make sure that the temporal, uh, the two data sets are matched in time. So that what we call is temporal matching. So they can be matched on a different time scales like hourly, every three hours, daily or monthly. One of the most important thing which we should be careful about is, is know your data time zone. I understand most of the satellite data are reported in UTC and some of the global, most of the global, uh, model outputs are also reported in UTC, but sometime if you're using a regional model or you're using some specific satellite, uh, they may be reporting in local time. So know the time zone. Uh, if, you, if you know the time zone, you can make the conversion before the comparison. And Python has nice functionality, which we will see uh, in the part three. Okay, a little bit more about the quantitative comparison. So another thing is the spatial uh, matching means we want to, in addition to matching with the time, we also want to match where on the earth you are comparing the two data sets. Now this can be tricky. And uh, as I mentioned, the size of the satellite pixels changes. So this is a typical swath of a uh, orbit of a satellite data. And if you look in the middle, uh, it will be a smaller pixel size. As you go, the pixel size will increase. Uh, for polar orbiting or geostationary satellite. Uh, on the right, it shows this, each box represent one pixel. So the size, as you see, as you go away from the nodded position at the edge of the swath, the pixel sizes changes. Models are typically fixed grid. Uh, again, sometimes they can be nested model, means certain area which is focused will be, have a higher resolution, another area will have a lower resolution. So you need to know about the spatial resolution, very, very critical. Some examples of spatial resolutions are given, like for example, Moody's aerosol optical depth is available at one kilometer, three kilometer, 10 kilometer or one degree resolution. So based on your application, based on science question, you can choose uh, which data sets you want to compare against. Okay, uh, so I think uh, it is important that to resample both data sets uh, on a given spatial grid before we compare quantitatively the two data sets. Uh, just a little bit more on that spatial uh, comparison. Um, you could actually extract the data uh, from the model and from the satellite uh, for different specific uh, region, right? You can average over a country or a state or any other bounding box or a polygon, whichever you want to define, right? And you can average the two data sets on that and then compare, that's perfectly fine. But you can also resample the data uh, if you want to do a more special comparison. So for example, in the picture, what you see is an example of swath data, which we just saw earlier, level two satellite swath data. In the middle, these are the fine resolution data, means the this in all these four box, you can assume that the area covered by this entire rectangular box is the same. So in this finer resolution, you will have a more number of values within that same box. So this is a, four by four, 16 pixels or 16 grid, uh, uh, sorry, 12 grids. In this coarser resolution, the same area is covered by only six grid means we will only have six values. So if I want to compare this fine resolution data which comes from the satellite to the coarse resolution data which comes from the model, let's say, then I cannot compare directly then. I will have to resample the data before I 
compare them. One option is I average both data on entire big rectangular box and then compare. That's feasible. Second option is I can resample this fine resolution data to same as the coarse resolution data. So instead of 12 pixels or 12 grid cells, I can have six grid cells just resample or average based on the resolution of the coarse data. The other option is I resample both fine resolution and coarse resolution to another resolution which is much coarser than both of the resolution to start with. So this final is a resampled at new coarse resolution uh, where we have only four values instead of six or 12 in the original data. So the choice of this collocation really depends on your application and the science questions, uh, what you want to do. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, there are different methods to do this uh, resampling. Uh, there can be in linear interpolation, there can be nearest neighbor, there can be box averaging, and we will see a code uh, using a box averaging method in our uh, Python demo. Okay, so tools for the comparisons. Uh, again, I want to highlight that Giovanni does have this specific set of analysis called comparison where you can actually produce scatter plots, you can do the maps of correlations and difference between the two data sets. This is an example showing the uh, MARA2 aerosol optical depth with MODIS aqua aerosol optical depth. So correlation on the top and the difference between the bottom. Again, Giovanni has a very uh, nice interface and you can do this, but it is only limited to level three graded data sets from the satellite. It does not provide the swath data. Okay, another tool which we already looked called resampler or re, uh, subsetter. Uh, this is uh, available for MARA2 and OMI data, which you have already seen in part one. So I will not get going through that, but that's another two tool to resample the data. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, Python demo now, uh, since we have gone through some basics about, and what we will do in the Python demo is uh, quickly, uh, we will use that Google notebook or the Jupyter notebook, which we uploaded to read the GSFP, download the data, map the data, export into CSV file, and then extract on a ground location. So let me switch to the my Chrome notebook here. This is the part where which we were working. I'll just pause here for 30 seconds so that people can get to this notebook and make sure your step two is run. If you have not started, this may be a good time. Just click on this arrow and it will start downloading and install everything. Uh, as you can see in my case, it has been already downloaded all the things which I needed, successfully installed all the things and I'm ready to go to the next step. But I will pause here for 30 seconds so people can catch up and then we'll move on. Okay, so I assume everybody is on the same page here. Uh, I will try to go through slow. So we already completed mounting. Those who joined late, uh, please run the mounting, the Google Drive steps and then installing all the Python package before we go to step three. Now in a step three, what all we are doing is just importing all the packages which we installed or there are some packages which are already available in the Google Colab notebook so that we can call them when we need to use them. Again, the same method I'm going to use, click that little black white arrow and it will basically import all the code. So the importing function does not take a lot of time. One thing you will notice that all these functions or parts of Jupyter Notebook or Python script, once they run, you will see a, a uh, sign which says this is done. And uh, it shows the time. So it took two minutes, one second, and so on. So that um, tick sign mark uh, demonstrate that your uh, that part of the code is run and ready to use. So you will notice that before we get to the actual data reading and mapping, we will run several functions. Uh, this 
is called additional resource. This function is to download the Mera2 data. We are not going to do that right now because we already have a sample file on which we are going to work, which is already uh, uh, uploaded on the Google Drive. Uh, but in future, if you need, uh, this is developed by uh, NASA GMAO group who produced the Mera2 data. All the documentation and the links are provided here. Just in case I'm going to run this function, it doesn't take a lot of time. Again, when I, I'm running this as a function, it means I'm just running it, I'm not calling it. So once this is run, then I can use it later on. Okay, so that's another additional resource using the same function to download the Mera2 data. Again, since we already have, we're not using it, but it's still, I'll just run it uh, just in case we run into some problem here. Okay, everybody is here. AR2, same thing for Geos FP, which is a forecast aerosols data. Uh, it The way this function is written, it uh, download three days worth of forecast uh, from, uh, you can change, this to five days um, and as long as you provide the date and directory where you download want to download it will work so again i'm not calling the function yet and just running it means making it ready to be called when if i need it similar thing for geos cf this is a chemical forecast uh, which will provide in addition to aerosols other components such as ozone nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, some other things. So the file formatting and the file name conversion is a little bit different. We have gone through that in presentation one and in the introduction of the quality forecasting pre rack training. So I'm not going getting into details of those, but I will just run this function again, just in case I need it. Now I'm on the step four. Uh, this is the function to read GIOS FP file. Again, GIOS FP is uh, means forward processing. It's forecast. Mostly we are relying uh, aerosol forecast in this particular uh, for air quality. Um, the GIOS FP is uh, assimilate uh, several satellite data, including MODIS aerosol optical depth to provide this forecast. So what this function is doing is, as you can see, the name is read file, file name, it will ask file name and the domain. Domains mean it's asking for the bounding box of the latitude longitude where you want to run or the read the data or the map the data. We will provide that in a little bit. Again, this is a function, so we are not calling it yet. We are just running it so that it is ready when we need to call it. Just quickly want to go through this function is uh, here you will see a list of parameter which we are reading from the file. And this list of the uh, parameters are some of the aerosol component which we already looked through in part one. And in addition to that, as we noted in part one that Mara 2 or GSFP does not provide PM 2.5 mass concentration at surface uh, directly as output, uh, you have to calculate using the equation. So this is the same equation which Melanie has shown in her part one presentation. We are using the same equation to calculate. Once this is done, everything is returned and then we can move on. Again, same functionality, but for GEOS CF. This is a chemical forecast uh, about quarter degree resolution. And again, in addition to PM 2.5, we have additional air quality relevant parameter like CO, NO2, ozone, SO2. All of them are reading, and then we can map and extract the information which we need. You will notice that each of these uh, functions also read the latitude and longitude, and that is required in order to map this parameter or extract this parameter on a given ground location. So we've gone through the step five. Now the step six is the same thing, but for the Mara2 data. Again, you will notice that Mara2 and Geos FP uh, parameter names are very similar and we can see them because they comes from the similar model and uh, system, modeling system. Okay, so we've gone through the step six. 
next is a step seven this is a more cosmetic step where we are trying to define the variable name for geos fp and mera2 as i mentioned they are almost same so we just defined everything here together and this is just to title and name uh, the maps uh, which we are going to do so this includes their name and their units and things like that again all are editable you can change them anything you want uh, or any parameter you like to extract step eight is same thing but for geos cf parameters again geos cf has carbon monoxide nitrogen dioxide and ozone sulfur dioxide in addition to pm 2.5 okay so we've gone through the step eight and now the step nine is a little bit different function what this function is doing is go ahead and click run it but what this does is it extract data on a given location if you provide the latitude longitude and data array of the input data then what it will do is it will ask you a question about the ground location once you put the into the ground location it will give you some statistics extract the data using two different methods one is the nearest neighbor and the box averaging method i will show you how that output looks from this function uh, this is a function design like i said it calculate for the nearest neighbor using considering earth spherical nature so it does calculate some earth radius and the nearest distance in kilometer and based on that it picks the grid corresponding to your uh, ground station okay now we are getting close to running or doing actual data analysis so far we were running all the uh, all the function which we may need to process the data so let me give 30 second pause here quickly so that people are up to step nine if you click up to step nine then we are good to go but i'll just pause for 30 seconds so that people can catch up okay so the step 10 is where we start working towards data analysis and the first thing like we discussed earlier we need two things one is we need to know where we are trying to analyze the data in geographical location and for which date so this step 10 is asking for the date of the data analysis although the way this function for this training purpose designed this is a kind of a repetitive process here in this but anyway we are going to go ahead and enter the date so that in case data is not available the function which we used for downloading they can run and download the data so since i already have the data so i'm going to put uh, 2022 and if you are running along with me make sure you use the same date so that it can read the data which you already have on the drive if you put a different date than what i'm using then it, the code will go and try to download and it can slow your process and you might not get to the next step so make sure for the purpose of this training uh, make sure you use the same date so i'll use the date in this format four digit year that is 2022 january 1 that is 01 and then sorry january is 01 and the day is 31st so i'm using 22 zero one thirty one and if i go back i can check this is the date of my data from geos fp january 131st january 131st so that is what i am using here once i do that i click enter and the date is stored in the function which is uh, or the variable called user date the next is a special domain where you want to map or extract or do things in your domain so since i know oh, based on my earlier look i know there was a dust activity during this time i am actually going to pick a latitude longitude range uh, which corresponds again for the purpose of training again i strongly recommend so that you can walk with me using the same latitude longitude range but if you want uh, to pick a really different latitude longitude range you can pick that the data files are global so it should work irrespective of that 
So the order in which we have to pick is minimum longitude. Uh, let's say I want to do uh, minus 60 degree, minus 60 degree, minus maybe let's say minus 100 degree so that I can see the United States coast. Uh, maximum longitude about 30 degree east, uh, ma maximum latitude 60 degree north, and then minus 20 degree south is my minimum longitude. Again, I click and then that domain information is saved here. You can also reset this uh, while you call the function later on. Step 12 is a quick step to uh, design the name of output file so that it can have this uh, bounding box information in the output file, which we will save uh, during the next step. So just click on the step 12 and then it will take the convert that string bounding box into the string. The step uh, 14 or the a additional resource four is an additional steps. Uh, we don't need that to run it here. Uh, this is if you are doing automatically selecting the file between GIS, FPCF or NARA2, it will do that automatically for you. But since we are not, uh, we are going to anyway uh, run different functions. So it, it doesn't matter whether you input that or not. But just for sake of running, I'm just running and just selecting GIS, FP. This is most important step. Uh, if you want to make sure that your code is working in today, this is the most important steps. What it is says is the drive. It shows the drive where my data is located. So AQF F22 session two, this is the directory where my data are downloaded. Now, how, I, how do I get this directory location in Google directory? To do that, uh, again, please look very carefully because if you do not do this correctly, you will not be able to run rest of the code. So I will click on this files folders on the left side. You see these three lines and there is a find and replace and there are a few other things. And then there is a folder logo on the left side, which case files. I'll click on that. It will open the locations. It will, the first one is the drive. That's where my folder is. My drive. And I have many, many different folders. The one which I'm working is called Google Colab Notebooks. In the Colab Notebook, this is the folder where my data is located. Now, when you upload the data to your drive, make sure you use the same folder. So I'm going to click on this and then if I click on these three dots on the right, it will open up and it says copy path. Once I copy that path, I can enter, use the directory, and then make sure you put a backslash at the end so that it, it knows that this is the directory. So this is my directory, make sure you make that change in your code. Since I already have it, I'm just going to delete to avoid any confusion. So make sure this directory path is there. So again, I will pause for 30 seconds to people to go through that exercise. If you have not looked at, again, click on this file or the folder, browse through the folder which you want, where the data is located, make sure the code and data are in the same folder. If they are not in the same folder, then it can create another problem. Click on those three dots, click the copy path, and then paste it here. Make sure to enter a backslash after you paste the copy path because that is the folder which we are going to read the data from. Okay, I hope everybody has done this. I will just, once I made, make the folder correct file path provided here, then I click this arrow and let it run. Okay, now the step 14 is the where we are actually processing the data and that's where we are going to call the function. The first function is to geos fp. 
And as we can see, user input and the date I have actually redefined here. So if you have defined already, it will overwrite here. Uh, if you want to use those functions which I defined earlier, you can comment them here. Then it will take whatever user input you have provided earlier. But since we are going to run for the purpose of this training, each data set one by one, I have actually selected uh, uh, redefine this user input just to make sure that it works. I also have a NASA uh, worldview link here. Uh, this is uh, if you want to uh, do a quick uh, check uh, on the image for that particular day, uh, you can go there and you will see that dust uh, outflow which we saw earlier. Again, it's going to ask you certain questions and then it will do certain tasks. So let's instead of going to the code itself, I want to go through the uh, functionality how it runs. So once you click on the arrow, it will run. And this is a interactive code. It means once you click on the arrow, it will not move on to the next step until you answer the questions which are displayed on your screen. So the first question it is asking is enter the variable to process. Like I said, there are many variables in Mara 2, which comes. The first one is total aerosol optical depth or optical thickness. Uh, both are same. And then the aerosols component mass concentration near the surface for nitrogen, organic carbon, sulfate, dust, and everything else. And then we also have a PM 2.5. We showed earlier that we are calculating that equation. So just for sake of this um, comparison, I'm going to do the PM 2.5 here. So my option is 10. So you need to put the number for which you want to process the variable. So I say 10 and then enter and it will go. You can browse back and then see that once I put it started saying processing GIOS FP processing PM 2.5. And then it will give you this nice map with the level PM 2.5 mass concentration for the date which you have selected. Again, uh, you can see the PM 2.5 concentration from GIOS FP is kind of showing the dust outflow which we saw earlier uh, from Saharan deserts over Atlantic oceans. So this is for January 31st quickly. I want to show you the link, uh, the satellite image here. This is link is provided again in the chat and in the uh, in the uh, notebook. You will see this dust outflow and there is a smoke biomass burning happening here. So both of them uh, are nicely captured by uh, GIOS FP in the PM 2.5, and uh, you can see how it is flowing over Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so once this is done. Then the next question it is asking is, do you want to save the variables to CSV file? So if you are more comfortable in using the data into CSV format, you can say yes, it will save all those variables into the CSV files. It can take some time depending on how big your area is. So it's already done. Now the next question which is asking is, we are calling those function which we defined earlier, the function which extract the data on a given location. So it's saying location within the domain. Do you want to extract the data on a given location? If I say yes, then it will give me some statistics of all the data within that domain. So these are the uh, mean standard deviation and medium value for the entire domains for the entire box which we mapped. Now I want to extract the data on one point location or one city location or one PM 2.5 monitors or whatever, right? But that location has to be within that domain and I can just pick, let's pick one location here, let's say 20 degree north and maybe 2.5 degree west, okay? So 20 degree north and then the longitude is minus 2.5 because it is west. Once I give that, it prints the nearest pixels is located exactly in the location where we have um, by coincidence. And then we also have the data. So these are the values corresponding to the three by three pixels. 
centered at the locations which is picked by the, 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 the code uh, or the latitude longitude which you have given these are the again mean median and standard deviation similarly for the five by five picks so these are important and as we look through the validation exercise you will see how you can modify this part of the code to actually extract the data on a multiple location so this is right now since it's a training we want to make sure that uh, it is more interactive that is why we code it this way but you can provide a list of station and that should uh, actually uh, be able to modify the code to perform that task so once you do this it has gone through all the process for the geos uh, fp data now there are two things which it has done so to see what it has done we will go back to our folder and just refresh it then you will see the additional files appeared in the folder one is the file which we mapped so this is a png file it means it's the map which we kind of displayed it's automatically saved in your same folder which you can use it second it created a csv file uh, for the data which we have so if i click on that this is a uh, little bit larger site so it may take some time uh, let me see quickly if it can preview me i just want to show how that file looks okay here it is so the way we have designed this file is it gives you latitude and longitude for the each grid box in the domain which you have defined and then it also gives you all the parameters which are there in the file now one thing you will notice here um, for some reason the nh3 is not printing so we will check on that code uh, there may be some bug there but i think the rest of the parameters are printing here and all the values are here so all the data are saved for you in a csv file and uh, uh, output in a nicely format tabulated format if you are more comfortable using the data this way okay now let's go back to the code we will do the quickly since we are almost one hour in our training and i have a few more slides to go over before we get into i want to quickly show some more same thing same functionality can be done using cf so i will quickly run cf again uh, cf is a chemical uh, forecasting in addition to pm 2.5 it gives other components so let's do uh, maybe co or the first one um, carbon monoxide and then it will process it will plot for the same domain again if you want to change the domain you can change as I mentioned earlier, there is a biomass burning going on in this region, and that's what we're providing uh, a lot of carbon monoxide in this part. Uh, you can do all the same steps. You can save the data. Um, if I say yes, it will save all the data from GEOS uh, CF. Uh, it will extract the data. Since we have already gone through this, I will skip this step and will say no, so that because it's exactly the same step. Only thing is it is going to produce the parameter which is carbon monoxide in this case okay so step 17 exactly same functionality but for nara2 data you click arrow and then it will go through that screen let's see if we can produce choose another parameter let's say dust pm 2.5 so i'm going to select the uh, parameter or maybe we can select the aerosol optical depth actually let's do the aerosol optical depth which is one click enter it says processing nara 2 tau ext is the total aerosol optical depth you can see again how the dust plume is all playing now remember the mera 2 data are a little bit behind so these are not corresponding to january 1st these are corresponding to 2021 june 30 so this is a different date and uh, i just want to let you know that when you use the data make sure you're using the latest version of the data i somebody just notified me yesterday that this data set which i'm using are an old version and mara has reprocessed after that so make sure you're using the latest version of the data uh, when you get to the data download there's always information about uh, what is the latest version so all those uh, be again it's part of know your data 
make sure you're using the best and latest data available for your analysis. Again, you can save it um, as a CSV file and just say no to save the time here. Um, same steps, extracting data on a given location, I'll say no, uh, just to because we have already looked that exercise. Okay, the last function before we move back to the slide is called regreading. As we were looking earlier, we did intercompare uh, satellite data with uh, with Mara2 or other uh, other parameters. So this is uh, if you want to do comparison like this, you have to regrade the data uh, from one resolution to another resolution. And we have gone through this slide where we show how to do that. So this particular function here is exactly doing that. We are using one of the method. There are many different methods to regrade the data, like interpolation, nearest neighbors. And this, what we are doing is called box averaging, means we take all the pixels or grids which falls within the newly defined box and then grid the data in that particular uh, function, uh, that particular grid box. So this is a function. Again, I'm just going to run it and we will call it uh, in an example. So in this particular example, we are actually using Mara2 data, which we just ran through over earlier. And I'm defining my grid size to be one degree by one degree, which is coarser resolution than the original Mara2 resolution, which is about half degree. And the, you can also redefine your domain here, but since I'm using the data from previously processed, now I'm going to actually just use the same domain. So again, this is a demonstration function. Uh, I'll click here and what it does, it goes through all the data in the, which we have already processed. So it will make a map of the data, original data. This is the um, original data original resolution for June 30, total aerosol, uh, aerosol extinction or AOT or aerosol optical depth. At original resolution, it will also map a transform regraded resolution. This is, you can see that uh, this is a lot more smoother function, which higher resolution, whereas the data here are more pixelated when they are coarser resolution. And you can do this exercise and uh, do this comparison quickly. You can save also the data here. Uh, I don't have the function put it right here, but you can use one of the function which we showed earlier, how to save the data into CSV file. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to show before we get to the validation part. I hope you were able to do some of these things uh, in your uh, exercise uh, while we were doing. So let's move on to the next part uh, of our presentation, which is a validation and intercomparison. So I'll just give pause for another 15 seconds to make sure people are back here. Okay, so the next part of presentation is going to be validation and intercomparison. And when we say validations, intercomparison means we are trying to validate the model output using the ground location or ground truth in other words. So there are some challenges when we start validating model output. They are not straightforward. And some of the challenges are very similar to what we saw when we are comparing with the satellite data, but some of them are can be new challenge. So why we do the validation? Validation is required, independent validation, which we call often, it is required to assess the accuracies and uncertainties or in other words, to characterize the errors in model output, whether it's reanalysis or analysis or forecast, it doesn't matter. And we do this because our Earth atmosphere system is very dynamic in nature, so it's continuously changing. So things are continuously happening and model is trying to simulate those changes. So it's a really uh, very, very critical that we time to time validate uh, using ground truth data uh, how the model is performing. Now, the frequency of ground measurements can vary, uh, means in terms of geographically, you will see that uh, certain region of the world has more ground measurements, certain region of the world has less ground measurements. So where you're comparing, uh, it depends on the availability of the ground data. 
Uh, the length of the ground measurements are also sometimes they are only available during a specific period, a specific season, once in a week, once in a day. Uh, it, it depends on the frequency of the measurements from the ground. And then often these uh, ground measurements are basically um, very stationary point measurements. They represent a small area near where you are making the measurements such as shown here. Whereas the model outputs are defined or averaged over a large spatial area, uh, what we defined as a spatial resolution or grid. So make sure that you, these, these, you're trying to compare this point measurement with the larger spatial area model output. So there has to be some assumption which we have to make in order to make this comparison happen. Quickly, some of the most popular uh, global networks through which we can get some of the air quality related data. Uh, the first one is the Aeronet. This is a NASA operated uh, aerosol optical depth sun photometer network all around the world. There are about four or 500 stations which makes measurements uh, and it is a federally monitored uh, network so it provides best available aerosol optical depth data. Uh, in, in order to do for air quality, the OpenAQ is a platform. It's not its own network, but what it does, it is gathers the data from all the available uh, sources uh, provided by the government regulatory grade monitors and some low cost sensors. So this is another source to get the air quality data such as PM 2.5 and other component. Purple Air is a uh, low cost sensors air quality monitor. This data is also available, uh, but it is a low cost sensors, means the data quality can be issue when we use this local sensor. But this is also a source for intercomparison at least, if not the validation. Sparta is a network specifically designed to support the satellite remote sensing of air quality. It does make measurements of optical and mass concentration, but there are very limited numbers of uh, ground monitors right now available, but again, a source for validating your model output. Okay, so let's le look a little bit more into what it involves to validate or compare the model output with the ground station. So first you need data file, definitely. Um, any model output, whether it's GIOS FPCF or NARA or for that matter, satellite, you need the input data file. And then you need to know ground locations, latitude, longitude of the stations or the city or the place where you are making ground measurement. In order to do the special matching, uh, you can do the nearest neighbor, just like we looked into the Python script, which can actually find the nearest neighbor of the given latitude look locations or the ground location using that code in the Python, you can use that, but you can also use box averaging and other methods to get the special matching. Uh, there are some popular averagings like three by three pixels around the center of the pixels, five by five, or you can pick certain radius. So in this picture, you can see if this is my ground station, I can draw a circles, I can draw rectangles, or I can pick a grid, model grid closest to my station or the model grid where my station is located. And then uh, it does, once you extract the data, then make sure you also include date and time out information from the model and from the ground data so that you can make them temporarily matching also, which will look next step. So the temporal co-location, so the step two, which is critical is temporal co-location. So in order to do temporarily match the two data sets, uh, we should have a ground data file with date and time information, and then the extracted data, which we've done in the step one with the date and time information. Now, if you have only, if you're comparing with the satellite data, typically most of the air quality measurements are available at one hour uh, temporal scales means every one hour we have the data. If you're comparing with the satellites like MODIS, you will have one observation. So you pick the nearest hour for that observation. So if it is 1030 satellite overpass time, then you pick either 11 or 10, or you average the two to get a average value for that uh, uh, to compare with the satellite data. The model outputs are typically hourly or three hourlies like GOSCF is uh, 
G both just FP and CF are hourly, hourly and three hourly available. So depending on how you want to compare your data, you can average them or you can pick the nearest hour depending on the uh, model time stamp and this uh, ground data time stamp. Uh, one thing to remember about when you're doing the temporal matching, like I mentioned earlier, most of this data comes with UTC timestamp, but some of the uh, air quality data from the ground, if you're getting from the local station, they comes maybe in local time. And when they comes in the local time, it is very critical to convert that local time into UTC time, or you convert the model output from UTC to local time to match the two. And we will see that exercise um, or an example at least in part three when we get to that point. Okay, so quickly, uh, I just want to uh, go through some of the statistical uh, parameters, which typically we calculate. Again, if you have taken the pre rack you will have seen this couple of slides. We can calculate the accuracy here using this formula where F is your forecast value and O is your observation. As you can see, we have taken the absolute value of the two. So this gives you an abs in absolute scene uh, sense mean closeness between the forecast and observe. The N is your number of data point. Similarly, bias is very similar, but this gives you not absolute. This is giving you actual value. So if it is negative means the bias is negative. It means the model is underestimating. If bias is positive, it means the model is overestimating. Some example of correlation. Correlation is one of the thing which we first look when we compare the two data sets. Uh, on the right, you see, for example, in the first one, the two data sets are correlating really on one to one line is correlation almost one. On the second, they are negatively correlated means if more if one parameter x is increasing then y is kind of decreasing so they are considered negatively correlated the third plot is more realistic way uh, where you have some scattered along the one to one line but there is a offset also as you can see where the regression lines look. the fourth one is really bad where there is almost no correlation the data is scattered all around the one to one line that can be considered as really bad correlation you can also do some uh, categorical uh, checking for example air quality is often defined by calculating air quality index and that can be converted into good moderate unhealthy very unhealthy categories so you can also calculate uh, this kind of matrix which we call confusion matrix where you have forecasted how many days uh, forecast data are showing good and on those days, what was observation is showing. So this is what it is divided. When you do this kind of analysis, again, look for the uh, task, uh, the recording of uh, introductory of air quality forecasting training, which was pre rack We have gone into exercise, doing this exercise in details. If you don't understand how to calculate the confusion matrix, and that will give you a good idea how we should do it. Okay. Uh, one more quick example of uh, analysis, which we call typically density scatter plot. So this is a version of scatter plot, and this we do typically when we have a data data points are large in number. If you have several thousands of data points, and if you plot them together, they'll plot on each other, and it will be very hard to see the real distribution of the data. So to avoid that, or to mitigate that problem of uh, more data points what we do is we call density scatter plot it's also called a 2d histogram uh, where you basically calculate the number of data points in each region of the scatter plot or each bin so let's say if i take a bin of x and y of 2020 and then calculate between 2020 and 25 how many data points are there and i just color code according to this color scale and then once you do this what it does is it provide you a density of the points corresponding to certain value in the scatter plot so i can see in this example here the red color shows the high density appointments most of the points are located around this one to one line and lower range of pm 2.5 there are blues which are scattered more and they are very less in numbers so this gives you really more confidence about uh, uh, how your comparison is looking if i don't have this 
sim, uh, density scatter plot but had a simple scatter plot then i won't be able to see uh, this i will i would assume that the my everything will look one color and i will have no way to find whether data density is high here and low here so this gives you an x idea there are python uh, notebooks uh, out there uh, we will see one example just in a minute but uh, there's a lot of them out there and the link is provided here if you want to explore yourself so let's go back to the python notebook and i will quickly give you a demo of making that scatter plot i hope everybody is having that notebook not closed it okay so we are on step 19 and the step 19 what it does is it's a very simple step it's a function to basically calculate some statistics which we looked earlier right so it calculates the number of data points slope of the line regression line one to one line r square is your correlation coefficients uh, bias uh, root mean square error and the p value which kind of shows uh, how realistic significant your correlation between the input uh, between the observed and model output so here is the function to make that scatter plot it's a simple function there's a lot of option there you can change that i will not go through them and in the last actually once that function is run it also save the data into uh, sorry save the output as a png file if i run this it is going to read that file which is there here this is my ground data co-located file uh, date and time information mara2 data and the ground data so this file i created in advance using a modified version of the code the get the data which is i showed earlier in the presentation this one uh, let me just quickly show it here one more time should be no and hold on yeah this one so this is the function called get point data where we enter one ground locations and get the data i use the same modified version of this code you just have to in, instead of doing all these things on a screen you can feed a list of uh, station here and uh, and list of date and then loop through and then it will uh, give you all the data corresponding to your ground location and that is what we have here and these are the ground data for that particular location that is what i am using here in my step 19 uh, towards the end of uh, notebook so i'm reading this file from the same directory and then calling this function to make the scatter plot so this is sample data again your x-axis y-axis whenever you are comparing the same model output um, same variable make sure your x and y scales are on the same uh, range so that it is better to see now i can see by looking this most of the density is close to one to one line but there is overestimation in the lower range of pm 2.5 values by the narrative so this is just an example uh, strongly recommend you validate your model output in your own location or your study region okay so i think that is all i have here uh, i will go back to the presentation and then i'll show you some quickly some more um, let me actually go to few polls here and see uh, how how many of you were able to do some of this python things so uh, let me quickly do some quick polls and make sure we are on the same page uh, okay so take about 30 seconds and respond to this code which model output can be compared with the satellite data in giovanni we just looked one example we gone through the giovanni last week uh, last in the last part on tuesday uh, i just want people to understand that uh, there are certain data which are available in giovanni and there are some which are not available in giovanni so we only see four percent voting uh, would 
strongly recommend everybody to vote so that we can see and we can work on it if we need to revise some of the concept 10 more second okay so it's almost one minute i'm going to close the poll uh, we only have 30 percent people voted um, and the results are mara 2 is correct answer uh, currently geos fp and cf are not available in ha giovanni okay uh, next question i want to quickly see if you were doing python run with me select all those component you were able to perform during the python exercise were you able to upload the data to google notebook were you able to install the packages were you able to do any of those analysis part where reading mapping or extracting the data or were you able to do any density scatter plot okay a uh, few more second we only had four percent people voted so if you have done walkthrough please respond to this question so that we have a sense of uh, how how much uh, our training were effective or if we need to modify something or if you need to revisit okay five more seconds we have about 40 people 40 percent people voted okay i'm going to close the poll we have about okay so look like about 90 percent people were able to upload everything and install the package about 70 percent 60 percent were able to do all those who responded so which is pretty good and then uh 49 50 percent people were doing the uh were able to do this cutter plot which is good okay the last question before we move on to the next part of the presentation is tricky one and it's a little bit advanced which but i have gone through this in the exercise um, can you use any of the python scripts shown today to extract geos fp forecast parameters for a list of 10 cities so select the best answer especially those who were able to run uh, yes, I can use it as it. Yes, but it will need minor editing or it will need additional coding. No, or I'm not really sure. So just respond whatever you feel. Um, you have another 10 more seconds. So after this poll, I have a few more slides to go over and then we will be done for the day. Okay, so I'm going to close this poll and share the results so the answer is yes uh, but it will require uh, some editing so the it whether it's minor or additional coding it's subjective it depends on how much and what exactly you're trying to do that but it will require some editing the get the data point is the function which you need to modify in order to uh, perform this particular task okay great so let's move on to the remaining presentation we have quickly five seven minutes more to go over and i will try to finish it again this is a um, schematic of uh, python jupyter notebook which we did uh, we had three different things to set up the environment we have additional functions to for downloading any of the data and then we have some analytical function which can map output and uh, extract or regrid or density scatter plot. So just to give you what we just uh, did using the Python script. Okay, so we shown you some uh, some analysis, and you will see some more type of analysis in part three when we do air quality assessment case studies. I just want to give quickly that those are not the only limited analysis. You can do a lot more type of analysis depending on your end goal. So one of them is like looking the air quality index. You can calculate the air quality index and compare, for example, in this particular site, uh, this is a air quality explorer for Thailand, which we have developed through an, another NASA program where we are comparing the 24 hour air quality index. So this is the date and then the blue line shows the measurement, the green shows the forecast and you can see both of them are showing close to each other. 
you can then compare in real time also hourly values this is every three hourly so another way to look your forecast sometime you can also do a uh, reanalysis comparison so this is for nara 2 this is over india uh, one of the group in india published a paper where they compare the nara 2 and actually uh, shows how the actual data looks on a daily scales on a monthly seasonal scale and then they come up with a bias correction method and then they were able to match the measurement with the nara 2 with some Correction. So you could do some correction locally, regionally uh, to make model outputs more accurate. Uh, when you do this uh, comparison or that scatter plot I showed earlier, when you do on our list scale, you will see uh, there is a lot of variability uh, from the observation and uh, output from the model. And this variability can be due to many reasons, right? We saw point versus grid resolution uh, comparison. There can be uncertainty in the model itself because of the way model is forecasting because of the lack of emissions or lack of uh, proper boundary conditions or lack of meteorological condition. And there can be uh, practical challenges, right? The, the observed point location may be looking a clean, area whereas the model which is a 50 kilometer box may be looking pollution event so in those cases there can be differences so when you look this data on a smaller time scale you will see a lot more variability a lot more noisy but as soon as you start then averaging over longer time scale like this is a daily you will see the scatter is reduced significantly on a monthly and annual scale they will start showing up more and more um, uh, closeness between the two. So depending on your application, you will have to choose the averaging window. You can also map the statistics. You can calculate all those statistics to bias, root mean square correlation. Again, showing an example from Thailand where you can actually, once you do this kind of thing, you can actually see how the spatial distribution of model performance is. So for example, in this case, uh, by looking the bias, I can see there is a high bias in the Bangkok area, whereas there's a low bias in the Northern Thailand. And this also kind of shows you the gaps in ground monitors. So in this area, we don't have any ground monitors. It means we really don't know the accuracy of the model in that part. Uh, so you can make some assumption and then uh, uh, do this analysis which should, to give you more insight about the model assessment. Okay, so the last slide uh, summary just want to remind or the take home message uh, we looked three different data sets uh, again though sorry there is a typo in the first one it should be nasa not goes geos uh, provides mera 2 which is a reanalysis with a data assimilation system geos fp a three hour aerosol forecast with satellite data assimilation into it and then geos cf which provide hourly forecast of pm 2.5 interest gas using a geos chem model and chemistry uh, we have seen multiple satellites provide valuable parameters to evaluate the model output it includes no2 s2 some some level of ozone uh, for column values and then the aerosol parameters including aerosol optical depth we also saw some example of there are several ground networks available for validating model output some of them are global in nature some of them are local and i understand many of you might be making measurement at your own institutions or through your organizations the python codes again want to repeat we provided are just an example you must check their accuracy modify to fit their uh, fit your analytical needs uh, again the analysis types which we showed are some of the popular examples uh, you can expand them uh, into different directions uh, to evaluate the model performance using additional analysis and finally i think this is most important that know your data know the model most importantly know your application and science question before you begin any of the analysis so this is really really important uh, aspect um, of an analysis so let me before i end i have a couple of more quick question um, and that will be all uh, and then we'll go to a question answer session okay so here is first 
this is again um, we did not cover specifically i did mention this aspect the question is if you must compare hourly aerosol forecast from model with satellite data select the best option uh, so there are two types of satellites polar orbiting satellites and then the geostationary satellite um, which one you will you pick and it depends on your application where you are located and everything but uh, what will be your preference provided both are available okay uh, i'll allow another 30 second we have only 28% people voted so far okay last few second okay so here are results the correct answer is geostationary satellite if it is available because geostationary provides more frequent observations so it will be nice to compare your hourly forecast from the model if you don't have geostationary then satellite polar orbiting satellite can also be used for that particular hour to compare okay and the last question before i answer your questions uh, we should use blank to compare model output with ground data for validation and into comparison purpose select the one which you want to put in a blank space temper collocation special collocation or both okay we only have three percent people voted so far have another 10 more second okay so let's see the correct answer is both and i'm glad almost everybody got that correct um, again this can differ uh, but uh, anywhere you want to compare the two data sets uh, matching the time of measurements and the region or the location is very very critical if we don't do that the comparison will not be correct okay that is good uh, so i think that's all i have thank you everyone for attending and we will move to the question answer in a minute i'd like to thanks all our team uh, sarah melanie um, brock uh, sarah jonathan and selvin for supporting in the back end of this training without their hard work this would have not been possible so thank you uh, everyone and let's move on to the question answer okay so let's get to the questions okay so the question one i will read it loud so that everybody have a chance to listen why swath data for instant model is three kilometer or 10 kilometer are not available in giovanni any plan to incorporate it so the giovanni tool was designed initially to do uh, some analysis which can be easily done online in real time and in order to do that uh, you need data which are well formatted and easy to access and small in size so they started with the gridded data and uh, over the years, Giovanni has expanded a lot of features, uh, but the nature of the tool is such that it only works on the gridded data. So they are going to currently stick with the gridded data. There's no plan currently to include the SWATH data, but I would strongly recommend there are other uh, ways in which you can get the SWATH data uh, from other tools. Some of them are offline, uh, which may be useful to you. Will there be any major difference in outcome if I apply bilinear interpolation instead of cubic convolution interpolation to resample the data? Uh, I think it will depends on the variability in your data. So let's say uh, you are doing aerosol optical depth over a clean ocean. 
and you are trying to uh, use different interpolation method, then I would say in those cases where the variability within your grid or region is not big, uh, the difference may not be that big. But if you are looking in a region where things are very dynamic, changing, or for example, there is a biomass burning and smoke is transporting and weather conditions are very dynamic, and you're trying to use different method, then I would say uh, the end results will be different depending on the method which you're using. So I think the method should support the physical processes in the atmosphere, which can capture, which method can capture that those physical process in a best way. Uh, Sometimes there's not just many options. So um, then you, you will have to make a assumption that, okay, I'm going to use the nearest neighbor or linear interpolation. And I believe that will work. Question three, is there any equation for calculating PM10 and PM1 similar to loop PM2.5? Okay, so I think there are uh, there is an equation for PM1 and PM10, and those are listed on that web page, which is given there. Again, I want to let everybody know that this transcripts of the question answer will be available for everyone to download uh, after the uh, after we review all the question answers from the training web page. So you will have that link uh, available to you. Okay. Question four, when entering the domain bounds, integer were used when specifying the point to be analyzed, floats were entered. I wonder if one can use integer floats. Integer. Yes, um, that was just convenient. Um, you can use either integer or float. It should accept both values. Question five, how can we save the image file of air quality so that we can further process it using GIS software. Okay, so we have not gone through that process here, but uh, there are two things. One is if you are downloading the data uh, from one of the sites which we shown, there is option to uh, uh, import the data into GeoTIFF, uh, that is one. There is also a Python script which can read the called GDAL, I believe that Python package, which can read the NetCDF file and convert into GeoTIFF uh, type of format, which is uh, GIS software uh, user-friendly. So question six, is regrading same as resampling? Um, so in my view, yes, um, but it really depends on how you are defining them. The, I believe they are not very strict. There's no very strict definition of the two terms. Uh, most of the time they are used for the same thing, uh, but um, it really depends on how you're using them. Okay, so the next question. Question seven, opt get is not recognized as an internal or external command. Operable program or batch file. I think this is because I'm not Linux user. Is there any alternate code to replace opt get for window users? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if anybody in our team who is window users and Python expert can comment on that, anyone? Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you or you use Mac. So we, we can find and I think uh, probably you can search a little bit on internet and you should be able to find the uh, alternate. Question eight, the regraded output is a raster, right? If so, then can we save it as a geotape with the help of GDAL model? Yes. You can, it's a gridded data, so you can save it using GeoTIFF or as a GeoTIFF using GDAL. Question nine, is it possible to download multi-temporal GeoTIFF GDAL 
data for a given location from JSDIS portal. Is there any Python code for that? So I think uh, I'm not sure whether you can download as a GOT or not, but uh, in next part, we will show a quick example where you can download uh, time series of data specifically for Mara uh, on a given location. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for attending uh, and we uh, we are going to use in part three Sarah will show us some more Python tools and how to use all these tools and data to analyze actual air quality events um, on next week. So stay tuned and uh, your questions or emails are there and uh, we'll be happy to help you further. Thank you everyone.